uh, such a privilege to be invited here to speak to you all and a, a special thank you for uh, being one of the individuals who really inspired uh, this project and has, has been advising us and guiding us uh, throughout um, through, through, through your individual work, but also the incredible leadership of uh, Center for Sustainable Futures at Teachers College. And I can't think of a better forum than this one to talk about some of the preliminary findings um, of this project and to, and to really share the outcomes. When we first sat to discuss this, um, I think it has come a very long way and it's uh, thanks to uh, your leadership and advice and guidance. Um, I'm also joined today, as um, you mentioned, by my colleague, Amanda Abram, and we have a lot to get through. So um, please bear with me um, as, as I share my presentation and we go from there. Um, give me one moment. I hope you can all see my screen now. Okay, great. Perfect. So we're off to a start. Um, okay, so uh, Global Schools is a flagship program of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the SDSN. The SDSN is a, a, a special program um, which uh, was launched by Ban Ki-moon and now currently operates under the auspices of the current UN Secretary General to advise governments and um, organizations and, and uh, municipalities on the best approaches and the best strategies to achieve sustainable development uh, by 2030 and 2050 respectively. Uh, we have networks all over the world, um, as you can see, as well as member organizations, but predominantly these are think tanks and universities and knowledge institutions. And the idea is that through these knowledge institutions, we generate the, the expertise and, and, and share with policymakers. Now, the mission of Global Schools is simple. It is to support schools and educators in shaping a sustainable world. And we do that um, through uh, research, and more so the um, applied and policy research, and through advocacy, and then, of course, monitoring those results to try and um, really improve, improve that process. Uh, so far, we have been working with 600 <laughs> adults, and around a thousand schools have been part of our work. And we work with these schools and advocates to try and really understand the challenges of education for sustainable development on the ground and trying to really build programs which we can scale, which really um, enables us to tap into any gaps or issues that, that, that pop up. And with that, I'll just hand over briefly to Amanda to talk a little bit about our advocacy program before we go into the overall project. Thank you so much, Sam. So yes, like he said, um, in the lifetime of global schools, we have trained 600 advocates. The majority of them now are specifically K through 12 level teachers in the primary and secondary setting. So this is these advocates, what we really believe is creating a global community of practice and promoting the SDGs and education for sustainable development as an integrated and interdisciplinary approach within school communities. And we're here to support educators and schools in this process. So just to give you just a really brief statistics on this program is 100 teachers this past month in our cohort were able to do 300 lesson plans and activities on the SDGs for around 9,000 students. And the other advocates that have not been teachers have done outreach um, over the lifespan to 7,000 schools and, and presentations to over 2,000 schools. This is really our grassroots level movement that complements some of the research work that Sam will share with you today. Um, it's really about instilling hope in students that they can take action on these global challenges and make them feel like they're part of something greater um, in this global movement around sustainable development education. Sam? Great, thank you so much. Okay, so about the research work, um, and just to give you some context, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched by the United Nations um, uh, General Assembly and agreed to by all governments. Um, and they talk about a sustainable future by the year 2030. Um, what the target 4.7 of this talks about the importance of uh, citizens to have the skills, attitudes and values necessary to tackle the greatest challenges of our time and also to shape a sustainable future. In other words, the, the really the, the, the core competencies of, of, of being able to um, uh, you know, respond to challenges and thrive in the 21st century. Um, and so this is really the, the, the key wording of Target 4.7, which I won't read out loud. And, um, and, I, and we believe there are basically more or less three dimensions of this. That is a, a deep knowledge of sustainable development and what that means as a, as, as a principle, as a systematic approach to how the world should progress. 
um, the values of global citizenship um, and of course uh, 21st century skills which all by the way overlap considerably but really a comprehensive look at uh, what needs to happen and what the kinds of dimensions of education that we need for the 21st century and and some of the core competencies that have been described as part of this type of education are um, outlined here. As, as you can see, they're, um, they're, they're quite broad, but they really underpin the, 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 the important um, uh, skills and values that, that, that uh, children need to be equipped with for a more sustainable future. Um, however, the problem is that currently in the world, we have more than a billion students who are in primary and secondary schools. Um, uh, and we don't have very clear figures on uh, how many of these students are receiving these types of competencies or are getting trained in these types of competencies, um, and nor do we get a sense of what the quality of those competencies um, are like. So in other words, um, are the majority of children in the world getting a, a good quality, a comprehensive, sustainable development education? And based on some data and, and work that we've seen around the world, it doesn't seem to be the case. And I think this is a problem because I believe we have a, a moral duty as well as a practical responsibility to equip uh, future generations with the skills, values, and uh, systems for them to shape a better world for themselves. Um, and this is really reflected by some of the reports that UNESCO has published um, uh, over the years. Um, and I think um, the, the, the challenges and gaps more or less point out to a series of issues, which I won't go into too much detail, but the fact that, you know, um, in, in, in some circumstances, um, some learning domains are favored over the others. So, for instance, cognitive tends to be a little bit more favored over, over socio-emotional and behavioral. Um, the work is not, is, you know, the kind of education for sustainable development work that is currently happening, or at least from our world that we advocate for, it does, it's, it, it seems to be compartmentalized. It doesn't, it maybe only looks at the environment, doesn't look at the social aspects. It doesn't look at the um, economic aspects. doesn't look at the whole picture uh, view. Um, perhaps it's not taught through in innovative pedagogies. Um, it's not adapted to the local language or the political context, or it's not linked to the curriculum. Um, it might not be culturally relevant. Um, it might not be compulsory, so it might be just an extracurricular activity a lot of people might not even be interested in. And it doesn't go throughout the entire journey. So I think there are lots of gaps that we see, um, at least from an international perspective, on when we're promoting as to how, um, how we really uh, deal with these very specific issues. So how do you close those, uh, how do you address those challenges and close those gaps? And this is really what inspired the country uh, research pilots that, that, uh, that we did over the past um, 18 months. Um, and uh, we, we were extremely lucky uh, to have uh, three incredible advisors, including Professor Oren Prismani Levy, Professor Aaron Reed, and of course, Professor Felisa Sivis, um, who were really instrumental in advising us on the process and helping to really launch a project which can find out what are the big gaps in the system um, and how those gaps could be overcome with a new methodology and with a new um, approach. So really that, that's where the work was inspired from. Um, and then we had the, um, the incredible partnership of um, uh, some wonderful institutions, including Al Ahwan University in Morocco, the uh, Mahmoud the Sixth Foundation for Environmental Protection, um, who, uh, who have been our incredible partners there as well, and really supporting and leading that work. Hazatepe University um, in, in Turkey and uh, the uh, University of Education in Ghana, Millennium Promise. Um, and the three projects, naturally, because of the wonderful partners and the efforts that they've, they've undertaken, happened in Morocco, Turkey, and Ghana by, by the respective uh, partners and knowledge institutions. Um, and we have also been incredibly lucky to have an incredible faculty and academic leadership on the ground at Morocco. We have Professor Abdul Karim Marzouk. In Turkey, we have uh, Professor Mustafa uh, Ustok, who was also uh, for a time at Columbia University as well. And in Ghana, we have Professor Andrews Ofori uh, Birikorangs. And they have really been at the cutting edge of this work and really been um, instrumental in leading this, adapting it and um, doing an impeccable amount of both um, uh, research as well as coordination, which I imagine is extremely difficult, um, especially in these circumstances. 
And the research project um, has been quite extraordinary. Um, we, there have been four, uh, four advisors, uh, five host institutions, three research teams, and um, more than 50 researchers at the, national, at the local level have been um, involved in one way or the other. There have been more than 80 stakeholders, more or less, that have been engaged and have been directly uh, involved in the process. There have been four languages, um, so Arabic, um, uh, French, uh, Turkish, and uh, English um, that we've been dealing with. It has taken 18 months and hundreds and hundreds of uh, data sheets that has come from the curriculum audit, from the committee formation, all the other processes that we've had. And of course, um, the publication, which will happen very soon. Um, and finally, the, the, the toolkit, which I will talk about briefly. In terms of the uh, objectives, I think there were basically two objectives. One is to take these um, key uh, education for sustainable development skills and competencies as defined by UNESCO, and then try to really understand firstly, to map, to find out how these currently are, uh, whether they exist and to what degree are they prevalent in the current education law standards and curriculum for K-12 education in each country. And then to set up a committee of um, experts and stakeholders who can give advice on that process, who can identify gaps and who can really reflect and also be the, the, the critical players in, in promoting this uh, once it happens. Then based on those that knowledge to create a series of lesson plans um, and then to then test and evaluate them in select classrooms. And of course, working with the committee to build a roadmap for their implementation. So that was really the first and the core objective. The second objective was to really uh, document this process very quick, uh, very uh, comprehensively in each country and to really understand the limitations of the process, what needs to change, what are the difficulties, uh, what are the uh, shortcomings and what are the opportunities and to really then build that process into a guide or a toolkit for future localization efforts in other countries. So really to learn and map the experiences of, of our wonderful um, local research teams. Um, phase one, we did an induction for the teams and really brought them on board, set the expectations and briefed them on the process. And it was launched um, in, in, in Rome in, in um, late 2019. Um, the second phase was the situation analysis. Um, and uh, it essentially had one objective to analyze the educational policies, law standards, and subjects-based curriculum across syllabus and textbooks and also testing regimes. And the methodology we used was we actually had to produce a 30-page instructions and guidelines for the research teams including an analytical tool that had more than 250 indicators. Um, and then in terms of the implementation, our teams actually then um, organized workshops and they did the analysis um, uh, where they applied the overarching competencies to, the, to analyze the laws and policies, but then they did the more you know, granular level analysis, which is uh, look at the uh, indicators across the curriculum, textbooks, et cetera. And then they went ahead and wrote a, 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 a report um, to anal um, you know, outlining the data and really analyzing the findings. And so we had basically three reports, three to 40 pages each, and you know, that doesn't include the hundreds of um, uh, data sheets, um, which, which we had in terms, of the, um, in terms of the indicators and their matches in, in the curriculum. And by the way, this was done in multiple languages. Um, and uh, I think that the teams did really well, but there were of course challenges, and this is how we did. Um, we kind of try to make sure that we're aware of those. So we did progress checks and conclusion call and a survey afterwards to really capture the challenges and the opportunities. So I think the number of indicators that we had to use was quite extraordinary, the 250. Now, um, I mean, it just, it made the work, I think, extremely difficult. And the reason we had to use those 20, 250 is because there wasn't um, a more, um, at least a shorter version of that, at least for the more granular subject level um, analysis. Uh, and we really took that from, from, from UNESCO. So the first thing we realize is that that's a lot of indicators. Uh, also, a lot of the indicators overlap. So um, I think it would have been good to get rid of some of them, or at least that's the, 
a challenge for us for the next for future phases. Um, and also the, the interpretation of the indicators. Now they, we try to make the indicators as clear as possible, but of course uh, they're subject to, in, um, to in, in, interpretation of the local researchers. And of course the volume of activity, 250 indicators across so many different subjects and, and textbooks. I mean, it, it, it's a lot and a lot of work. Um, the other issue was the flow of instruction. So making sure that everyone and every team and all the, you know, the huge number of researchers involved were all on the same page. And, you know, we didn't give enough of a time frame. I think we originally put a, um, you know, 10 weeks, but actually this took about three, more than three months. Um, but uh, it was quite extraordinary to see at the end, the motivation levels were, were very high um, with the survey. I mean, most of researchers said this was a lot of work, it was challenging, these were all the challenges, but they were very motivated and um, they, they were quite satisfied and that was great to see and they wanted to keep it going. Um, and a lot of them, because they believe that this is something that they want to do for their country, for, for their students and, and, and for, the, for, um, you know, for the sustainability of, of, of their uh, community. Communities. Uh, so once the reports were handed in and, and we looked at that, then it began phase three, which was to form a committee. In a, essentially, it was to form a national committee consisting of the key stakeholders. So they can firstly um, um, give feedback on the research outcomes and their application, but also provide advice on the bigger priorities and strategies, as, as mentioned. And really, in the end, to serve as really ambassadors for, 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 for this work. Um, so um, this again, we had a methodology, um, but most of this was just composition and a rubric for the creation of the national committee and some templates, invitation letters, concept notes to make it easy on the research teams to really then change this to their respective languages and to then build a, a committee which, which more or less fits a common criteria. But of course, we provided some flexibility in, in how they define that. In terms of the implementation, workshops were set up, the committee um, um, to determine the committee composition, the list of potential individuals, invitations were sent, and then of course we did progress checks in the middle. Um, and in terms of the submissions, we, found, we had from each country a list of committee members and their biographies, and of course, uh, meeting summaries where they were available and an overview of how the meeting went and uh, whether there were concerns, what, what um, um, the stakeholders thought of this, and, you know, um, basically some basic reflections. Um, some teams, of course, went further. Our team in Turkey went even further and actually put together an additional committee to really pull a task force of teachers. And I think that was actually a, a really good addition to that process because it not just looked at the overall strategy, but actually a, a task force on the ground to really implement and work more directly with, with, with the teachers beyond the few that were on the uh, committee. Uh, the challenges, of course, was uh, to make sure, um, you know, we're not duplicating efforts and we're not crossing wires on the grounds. That can sometimes happen. And of course, uh, this were very early days that and the uh, challenges and threats of COVID-19 were emerging. So the logistics of organizing a committee meeting, especially in person, um, would have been uh, very difficult. And, and it certainly was for some team members, um, uh, for, for some of the na uh, country teams, um, but also the many other disruptions that were, that were being caused. But regardless, I think it was, it was a good phase and it was more or less completed um, successfully by all teams. And uh, the survey shows that the motivation was still just as high and, and just as much excitement, but a little bit more uncertainty around COVID. Um, and of course, shortly after this, COVID actually hit at full force, lockdowns happened. And I think this was probably the single biggest challenge that we had for this project, um, to be able to really do this work um, uh, with schools and universities, which really were, were, were struggling to, to keep up and adapt to the, to the logistical challenges and educational challenges of COVID-19. Um, phase four was localization and adaptation. And um, I, I would say probably this phase was probably the most complicated for us at the secretariat level to draft and put together. Um, and it really had two dimensions. One was to get the teams on the ground to think about an overall strategy early on. And based on that strategy to create a series of lesson plans, which they can then, uh, based on their findings, and then which they can then adapt and uh, really test in the classroom. But this wasn't the testing, this was just an original design. So we had a 25 page uh, instructions, it uh, outlined the various strategies. 
Um, but then it went on to the uh, lesson creation and lesson adaptation. So there was a localization of that and the step-by-step -step guide. There were some adaptation guidelines and some content creation methodologies, which were essentially adapted from, from, from uh, other work and from other experts, and then some sources of, of where they could get find inspiration for, for content that they can, they can adapt and localize and of course a, a a tool and framework for lesson plan creation we also put a we put together a, a short webinar with one of the architects of, of, of um, these lesson plans that we wanted to use as the baseline uh, but professor uh, fernando Rimas from harvard university and i think that was uh, partly helpful in, in really getting the teams to think about this process and of course, then in terms of the implementations, the team went ahead and they reflected on the overall strategy options, which I'll briefly describe as transformative, incremental and extracurricular. Transformative is really around reforming the entire education curriculum. So is that the path that the committee is thinking of going down potentially? This wasn't determinative, but rather just broadly reflecting on. Secondly, would it be incremental? So would it go into textbooks, but not necessarily the reform of the curriculum, but rather a more add-on model or would it be extracurricular where you know but a decentralized approach and some teachers would just volunteer to do this in their classroom but not mandated from policy so really for for teams to think about these various options and of course there were there were consultations with the members of the national committee as well and um uh, of course then the final part was to use this content to create lesson plans and get feedback. So the sample lesson plans were, uh, were, were created and then they were submitted to us um, in both local language and also translated to, to English so we can, we can, we can keep track. Um, the biggest challenge was, of course, for our team in Ghana, which because of COVID-19 basically had to um, pause the project. They couldn't go further at that stage um, because it really hit uh, them very hard early on. And so they, uh, they, the project was put, put on pause because of that in Ghana. But uh, luckily, both other teams, despite the challenges in, in Morocco and Turkey, which were many, so they still managed to push on. Um, it was a complicated process. It was quite multi-layered. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty around the longer term strategy because of the pandemic and many other issues. And of course, um, because of local circumstances, we had to allow some deviation from the process in different uh, shapes or forms based on capacity and, and local circumstances. And of course, language um, and motivation. We did notice a little bit of motivation drop here because of these challenges, but regardless you know, from the surveys, they seem to be quite high even, even then. Um, and of course, this is really the, the, the final phase, um, which is the testing and evaluation. And um, the idea here was to evaluate the impact of these lesson plans on A, student engagement, B, student learning, C, student behavior, and D, teacher satisfaction, which we believed were kind of the key uh, dimensions of why this kind of approach would be important um, and, and factors that would be taken into account when um, when really promoting this kind of education. Um, and really to, if possible, to also evaluate this versus the more global and international lesson plans and to see how effective they are. Um, this, this, I, I mean, this was also a very challenging phase, at least for us um, and much more so for our teams on the ground. Firstly, we had to put together a 30, page, 30 pages of instructions, including the hypothesis, the research questions, the template pre and post surveys, and an adaptable quiz section, which can could be adapted to the local lesson plan and the learning objectives that they had designed accordingly. There was the post um, uh, uh, classroom teacher surveys, and of course the methodologies and sources for the creation of quiz. Um, th th this was a truly challenging process because uh, because of COVID nineteen. Um, in a lot of countries, there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, whether you could actually, you know, with teachers currently struggling to even, uh, you know, get to their own curriculum, whether they would be able to actually do something like this, you know, put additional pressure on them, and we certainly didn't want to do that. 
Um, and even in some circumstances, even if teachers were willing, whether the governments um, or the, the, the important stakeholders were on board, and you know, it was also a procedural matter um, as well in some cases. Um, but overall, um, uh, you know, we, we, we basically saw that um, the process was more or less handled in the following way, which was a, a workshop was set up um, where um, they engage with volunteers or partner schools and teachers. And then the partner schools and teachers were, were briefed and then data um, and basically was implemented and then data was collect, collected and there were individuals who were doing the observation data entry. And then of course the analysis and report writing. We have almost finished this phase in the sense that um, and really, um, only one country was able to complete it, and that was Morocco. And again, because of the other challenges, the other two countries have had a difficult time, which is um, really out, out of their, their hands, but they're still trying to see whether this can be done in time. Um, and, the, and, the, and the final report will come in this week on, on the results, but early indication from discussions that we've had shows a very uh, positive uh, result from this. Um, so the, this report, 20 page report will outline the main findings. It will look at the statistical um, significance of the results. And of course, uh, feedback from the teachers who did the survey. Um, and we were very thankful to Oren for helping us design um, um, uh, parts of the survey and giving us feedback on, 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 on how to um, you know, design it in an effective way. So, which I think was actually one of the challenges for us um, to be able to ask the right questions, the length, the post, um, and we, again, had to rely a lot on the advice of individuals such as uh, Oren, as well as our local teams in particular, very helpful to have had our Turkish team who, who are experts in this really help um, us think about some of these questions. Um, as I mentioned, the implementation of survey in Turkey and Ghana was, was close to impossible because of all the other challenges that existed, not because of a lack of willingness, but, but, but the complications. Um, but also in Morocco, where um, our early discussions showed that the data collection and entry was very difficult because there was just so much content and so much data points. Um, and this is, by the way, something we were warned against uh, by Oren saying that the data collection and entry would be difficult and to shorten the, um, the, the, the questions. Um, and uh, I think the uh, other issue was the capacity of the educators. So the length of the lessons themselves, but also the, the course surveys were, I, I think, quite long. And this is why a lot of data was generated. So uh, really this is, um, this is we're, we're, we're this far, but uh, phase six is more of a implementation roadmap and this will happen after May. So in terms of the next, uh, you know, the reflection and next steps, um, I will briefly um, go over these. So far from the project, we've, we've come across the following challenges, which is capacity, bandwidth, and funding, and both the global and local levels. So I think those are, those can be very significant barriers. Um, a lot of this work has been done by, uh, in fact, all, almost all of this work has been done by uh, volunteers um, who, who really care about the cause, but that still is a lot of work to do, especially on top of existing work, and also because of the complications of the, of the pandemic. COVID-19 made logistics difficult. The local circumstances and the fact that we're dealing with multiple cultures and languages, I think, uh, were, were, were an issue. But of course, the political barriers of being able to actually get the support of the ministries on board can sometimes be quite difficult. Uh, the time frame moved around a lot because of the uncertainty. And of course, we had to try and balance standardization versus flexibility. So how rigid do we make the instructions? How, how, uh, to what degree do we allow flexibility? And if we do allow that flexibility, uh, how far will it deviate from, from, from the original content and will we we'll be able to actually compare across countries? So that was another challenge that, that we were constantly uh, grappling with. And of course, the frameworks and tools, which was missing. So we had to really kind of take everything and adapt it and change it. And, and I think that took a lot of work. Uh, this is another thing that uh, I frankly found quite surprising is the empirical research gaps. Um, we didn't realize how new this area of education for sustainable development is and how much actual empirical research gaps exist. Um, so 
um, I, I think it just shows that how much need there is for the work that you're doing at Teachers College um, to be able to fill those gaps. And, and, and uh, I, I think it, it is evident that these are needed. <laughs> From our own work, we actually needed it really bad and we, we, we couldn't necessarily find, find the right um, uh, content there. Um, and finally, because of the lack of um, um, capacity, it made it very difficult to have an external evaluation of the results. So um, even though we're going to publish an evaluation, survey, an evaluation report, it's going to be internal. So, um, you know, there, there is a, it doesn't have the independence that it needs to. So, and that was mostly because of capacity issues. Um, but it also created many opportunities. Um, so it, it's going to lead to a peer reviewed uh, paper. It has in part inspired an edited book on this topic, in, uh, which is led by a wonderful colleagues in, in Turkey. And it has um, pointed to new areas of, of, of inquiry that need to be uh, capitalized on. In terms of policy opportunities, it has led to the emergence of Mission 4.7, which I will talk about briefly in a moment, and my colleague Amanda. It has um, really helped us create a methodology which could then be changed and adapted. And uh, of course, it needs a lot of um, reform and a lot of um, uh, work. Uh, but I think the, the core is there. Um, it really has helped highlight the importance of localization. I think that the sustainable development sector, we thought that if you have the knowledge and you push it down, it will, and it will take hold and it will change the world. But actually, um, it has helped us realize how complicated education systems are and how important it is to be able to localize um, to, 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 to the national context. And of course, in, in Ghana and Morocco, we've seen some very interesting results in that the ministries of education have taken a lot of interest in this work. And there seems to be quite a bit of an appetite for continuing this work at a much higher scale. And uh, so that is wonderful to see that, that at least despite these challenges, some of our local work has been, and has, has, has been taking shape and has been having an impact. But in terms of the network opportunities, I think and the connection to the national ministries, these national committees have helped. Um, but also I think in some countries it has helped create um, a community of practice of researchers, of, of teachers and schools and, and friends and has really, I think, um, helped in that regard. Uh, it comes with its own challenges, but I think these have been some of the opportunities. And the outcomes, of course, will be that um, at the UNESCO conference uh, on the 17th of May, we will uh, publish and launch our three national reports, including one shorter evaluation uh, report. And so the next step for us after the, the publishing of the report is to work on the implementation what roadmap. So how do you actually uh, implement this? Uh, the peer review paper, and we will uh, put together the localization toolkit. And of course, we will do this under the auspices and feeding into the work of uh, mission 4.7 which we'll discuss shortly. So this is the launch of the UNESCO conference. And with that, I'll hand over quickly to my colleague, Amanda, to wrap it up. Hi, um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to uh, the work about our, our research pilots. And we want to leave about 20 minutes here for Q&A. But I will just mention one final thing that we're doing. Um, so we brought together this high level organization we founded along with our incredible partners called Mission 4.7. So this was founded in partnership with the SDG Academy, as well as the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, uh, UNESCO, as well as the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. And the purpose is really to bring leaders from government, academia, and civil society and business together to accelerate the implementation of global citizenship education, as well as education for sustainable development. So this is kind of the pathway going forward. It's really recognizing that it's crucial for people across all lifespans to really be able to have this education and respond to the challenges of this world and create more inclusive and resilient societies. I do want to leave time for Q&A, though. Um, this is just briefly our leadership mission 4.7. Um, you can see it was founded uh, by the Honorable Audrey Azoulay from G Director General of UNESCO, as well as um, Ban Ki-moon, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations. And those are our various co-chairs. Um, Sam. We also put together a high-level advisory group of um, people from various um, organizations, as you can see right there. 
And then we also put together an educational task force um, formed from professors, academics, and others that will help us with these projects going forward. It's a technical education group. So now we're open to questions. Um, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We're very happy to hear your thoughts and, and gain your feedback on this entire um, process of this localization of national curriculum in these three pilot countries. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Sam and Amanda. Um, questions, comments? And what you can do is uh, you can just raise your hand um, virtually or manually, and I will call you um, in order. Maybe uh, Amanda, if or you, Sam, can stop sharing the screen, we can all see uh, the faces. Yes. I will. Okay. Um, stop sharing. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that for you from here. I think I can do that. Here we Sorry. go. Okay, so we have one, we have two questions already. Let's start with um, Oigoga, Onu. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hello, good day to everyone. My name is Oigoga Onu, and my global schools advocate from Nigeria. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation by the director of global schools, the person of uh, Sam Lonai. We appreciate that. And uh, my question is, um, I would like to know what, you, in your own opinion, you consider as the greatest challenge in engaging uh, commitment from uh, participants in the, in the research that you conducted in these three countries. Because most of the times I do know that because of the pressing economic hardship going on in uh, most developing countries in Africa, most persons uh, tend to shy away from uh, uh, projects of this nature. But I would want to know how you have been able to overcome that barrier, mentation of those researches that you conducted with these three countries. Uh, thank Perfect. you very much. Thank you. Um, would, should, should I just answer it now? Uh, okay, yeah. great. Um, I think you've, you're asking an excellent question, um, which is, uh, why a lot of people uh, got involved, and, and 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 I wish all the teams were here so they could answer this themselves. But but really, in a nutshell, I think because um, our uh, our colleagues on the ground uh, felt that this is something very important for their communities, and this is um, the the kind of work that they want they want to do, and, and the kind of work that's important. And so, um, actually, I didn't have to do much convincing because they themselves really wanted to do this, and they let it. But having said that, um, they uh, the, the the issue is very true that they also had many challenges in the ground, volunteer work on top of all this existing effort. And frankly, I am I am shocked by how much they were able to achieve despite these massive challenges and 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 if i could i think um the um, in, in future it would be very important to be able to uh, uh raise the funds to be able to build additional capacity but 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 that that can be um challenging so um i think um uh, from our perspective we we, we had um a, a lot of colleagues who did this work because they believed in it but also um in particular in uh, Morocco and, and Ghana, we had two uh, partner institutions, Millennium Promise and um, the uh, uh, Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, who really led this work and were able to provide uh, the, 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 uh, some financial contributions in order to actually uh, run the project more centrally um, and to really keep the engine room running. Uh, so I think it was a combination of, of, of their efforts and all of the uh, volunteer efforts of, of, of the individuals on the ground uh, with the recognition that there were, of course, many challenges and I, I wish we could have done more to help. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, we have two other questions in the chat. 
Um, one is coming from uh, Mujeda. Uh, can global advocates contribute to the SDSN research? Uh, yes, absolutely. So just on, on, on the uh, work that we're doing here, we're, we're always looking for um, uh, individuals, uh, whether they have expertise in sustainable development or in education, to, uh, to support us and to contribute. We have a wonderful team of, um, uh, of volunteers uh, who, who have really been helping and have um, have made this this project work so we're always looking for manpower <laughs> for woman power and additional uh, capacity and support so absolutely um, that's on the research side on the advocate side Amanda perhaps you, you would like to say a couple of words yes I think one of that question was asked by one of our advocates I see many of our advocates on this call so it's great to see all of you but yes if there's any way we can connect you with in-country projects we're, we're really happy to SDSN like we shared at the beginning is a huge network and with the launch of mission 4.7 we're hoping to have a lot more opportunities to do this very important work within schools but also outside of school communities as well Thank you, uh, Sam and Amanda. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to read another question for the chat and then I'll, I'll ask Eva Maria for her question. But um, we have a question from Valerie. How much coordination is there with other UN agencies and what do you think the most sustainable funding sources are? So, so I think there are two questions on, on that front. Um, uh, in terms of the work of Mission 4.7, as I said, really, um, it, it came out of this recognition that um, no single organization or entity can, can tackle all these complicated challenges, especially at a global scale, and that we really need to bring a lot of different actors, experts, um, practitioners who have been doing this work for decades and really try and bring everyone together. Um, and so that took a lot of, I think, effort, but actually it was, it was wonderful. And that took a lot of coordination with our wonderful colleagues at UNESCO, uh, who, 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 have, who have supported this process and were the co-founders of, of this mission 4.7, and in particular to Her Excellency um, Stefania Giannini, who's, who's, the, who's one of the co-chairs there. So yes, there's, there's been a lot of coordination, weekly discussions on, on how we can make sure uh, Mission 4.7 can broadly um, transform um, and accelerate the process of education for sustainable development, but also how these projects, whether the advocates project, whether they're the research project and some of the work that are being led by many um, experts and practitioners, um, including in the Center for Sustainable Futures, can then inform um, that work and really help uh, devise the strategy and, and um, um, the, the overall direction of, of Mission 4.7. Yes, a lot of um, uh, coordination. In terms of um, the uh, uh, funding uh, sources, um, I think that's a little bit more difficult to answer. It depends for what and uh, in what context, but there, there are, uh, I think, opportunities to be to tap into some existing funds. They, it, there's a lot of work involved, um, but we are trying to make sure that if this kind of uh, if this kind of work is also adequately uh, funded. So through Mission 4.7 and Global Schools, we're thinking about some potential funding um, streams and through grants and uh, scholarships to be able to um, to really maximize this this, this work. Uh, so um, stay tuned, and we'll, we'll share more with you on that. Thank you. Uh, Eva Maria? Hi, I'm Eva Maria, uh, postdoctoral researcher in empirical ESD research um, from the University of Education in Freiburg in Germany. And I first would like to thank you so much for sharing this wonderful research and project. Um, I'm very impressed <laughs> by the volume and, um, and what you just presented. And um, I worked on a, just a very, very small component assessing the development of competencies, ESD competencies in just one small <laughs> federal state in Germany. And it was already quite hard doing all the empirical um, assessments and so on. So I'm, I'm wondering from your experience um, with uh, this global scope that you're trying to capture now, um, what was your impression? Um, was it possible to come to um, an, an easy 
common understanding of what ESD competencies should be assessed or was it a hard a process and um, how did you make sure to to integrate all this local specific uh, specific um, curricular aspects etc thanks so much uh, firstly thank you for your kind words um, no, thank you. appreciate it and um, I think uh, firstly we to, to your first question which is like how did we convince um, people that these these competencies are, are important I think that's how I understood it um, uh, I think um, the fact that they these were some of the competencies that we didn't you know just pull out of thin air they were they've been there and they've been identified by you know, leading researchers in this space, um, including um, uh, UNESCO, that made it easier to say that the, 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 you know, this framework already exists and this is based on empirical research and, 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 and data from previous studies that these are some of the key competencies. Um, and I think in terms of being able to actually, uh, you know, run this on the ground, um, you know, it was it was it was it was a challenging process, but I think um, again, um, the, the the teams were very capable, and they managed to pull all of this together, you know, in time and to do an incredible job. So uh, yeah, if it wasn't for that, I think it would be very difficult. And in terms of the actual process, we had some wonderful advisors like Oren who were able to help and help us define the process. Um, of course, if we had better indicators or a shorter number of indicators, it would have made everyone's life much, much easier, but, but we didn't. And I think that's a, that's a lesson for, for um, the next iteration of this work. Thank you, Sam. I will just uh, interject a quick comment that uh, the theme of measurement and the competencies on ESD and climate change education has come again and again in this uh, series of discussions we've been having over the past year. So Eva, Maria, and Sam, um, we might want to organize another meeting, uh, another webinar where people share different perspective on these uh, questions, because as Eva said, even measuring it in one state in, in a Western country is a challenge, let alone doing it in an international or comparative fashion. So I think there is more that we can talk and discuss on the measurement aspect and coming up with some kind of best practices from what we learned. So I'm more than happy to uh, uh, facilitate that, that kind of discussion um, later this summer. So Eva Maria, um, you just got in trouble. I'm going to, uh, to send you an email with a request. We have another question uh, online uh, on the chat box, sorry, from Anwari. Did you find a question from teachers like, why do I have to bring sustainability into the classroom? Do, teachers even challenge this? And if yes, if you did experience that, how did you address this kind of question? So I will, I will answer very briefly and then I'll hand over to Amanda. This was actually probably one of the most important, um, uh, you know, not just for this project, but generally one of the, one of the biggest obstacles, which is um, I have many other challenges in my classroom or if you're a minister of education i have many other challenges with education in general in my country literacy attendance teacher satisfaction etc so and everyone comes to me with new agendas so why should i take time to to then prioritize something like this when you know we're dealing with so many other problems and i think our response uh, at least the instinct for me was is there any evidence which shows that this type of education actually helps with all the other stuff? Will it, in a way, make the work of the minister or the teacher easier? Will it help increase satisfaction? Will it increase attendance? Will it increase test scores? And that's the kind of research that we actually struggle to find a lot because, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of it. But thankfully, there was some work done by Stanford University which synthesized some of this. And we also did some work our own with our colleagues at Monash with, with um, um, one of our advisors, Kathleen, uh, which actually showed that yes, it helps. Um, this type of education is not just good for society, it's also good for education. And I think that, that, that is a key argument that we need to keep making over and over again um, as, as, as advocates. Um, and perhaps Amanda, you, um, you've worked more directly with, with the teachers, perhaps you can reflect on that as well. 
Yeah, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Teachers have such a variety of things that they need to um, work on in their classrooms. So kind of the model of our teacher advocates program is we choose teachers who we believe can be a catalyst and spread these messages um, to their wider school communities and inspire others and inspire other classrooms to really take up these challenges. So those questions from the te those teachers are not necessarily why sustainability, but how do I actually do this in a lesson? How do I apply this pedagogically in a classroom? And how do I convince school leadership to support me because oftentimes um, there are schools that are doing a lot of amazing things and teachers that want to get engaged but they're lacking these other elements of support so I think that's also one of the reasons for the mission 4.7 launch is how do you tackle these problems from the other angle and make sure teachers actually have support for working on these issues in the classroom um, we have time for one more question and uh, in the chat box there is a question from Aki um, sorry, here we go. Did you observe um, any cooperation between the local education administration, uh, the local education board and schools on this issue? Did you find any cooperation between these two agencies? And um, can we observe uh, good practices in schools? Um, there is a question about that as well. Let's, let's take both of them. I think they, they are important. Yeah, absolutely. So on, on the first one, we definitely noticed a lot of cooperation. Um, it's and not just between the ministries of education and, and the teams, but in, 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 in two of the countries, we noticed a relationship developing between the, um, you know, there was some relation to begin with, but it just became stronger um, and new relations were developed with other ministries, such as foreign affairs, um, ministry of environment, et cetera. Um, and of course it has really led to emergence of new networks. So yeah, we, we noticed that this kind of work where you catalyst bring everyone together actually increases cooperation. And I believe to, 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 to some extent it, it, has, it, it has, even where the ministry wasn't on board and the governance aspect wasn't on board, at least at the local level, the, the organizations, the researchers, it has kind of led to new partnerships on, on that front, which, which has been great to see. Um, uh, and the second question was around the learn, the, I think it was about best practices for schools, am I right? Um, yes, it, it was. Yeah. We can observe more and more good practices in schools, but they are not always sustainable because of lack of support or financial um, support for that. Um, so the person is asking, I would I really appreciate if you could share some findings or ideas on this respect on how to make the sustainable education intervention more sustainable. Yeah. In terms of long, long term. Mm -hmm. So what, one, one quick thing is that actually part of the reason we couldn't complete our evaluation in, in, in some, in, in, in some context was because, you know, the, the teachers didn't have direct um, a permission from the ministry, for instance, to do this kind of work, and you know, it just didn't. There wasn't a lot of uh, room for that. Uh, so those limitations definitely exist. Now, in terms of the actual best practices for schools, I think perhaps Amanda, you're um, you're better positioned to answer this from the advocates program. And in terms of the re research work that we've been doing in the countries, we'll have to wait for the final reports and final outcomes. Uh, but, I, but I do think that we have seen some positive observations. Uh, Amanda, perhaps you can wrap it up. Yeah, we've seen a lot of good practices in the schools that we work with as far as teachers taking um, this agenda on their own and integrating SDGs and sustainable development education with their students. Um, one of our schools put together a water filtration system and did all project-based learning around that. Another school made SDG ambassadors out of students. Another one is focusing on health education. So really amazing good practices. But what I will say is, you know, it really takes a couple different pieces. One is having the supportive school leadership. And, you know, that's a huge barrier barrier for schools and teachers if they don't really have that vision around sustainability and if they don't really have those that funding and financing support. Um, the other thing is the teacher training, which I see that's also in the comment, which is was the purpose of having the advocates program is to really train teachers, build their capacities. And, you know, this is something we're definitely trying to um, increase and have more workshops for teachers and really improve this level of training that we're able to give teachers as well. And I think those are really the key pieces that help teachers be successful in the class room as well as you know physical resources and funding okay uh thank you so much amanda and sam for uh this wonderful presentation and for all your important work on promoting 
education for sustainable development uh, in these three countries and beyond. 